So uh, first, I'll introduce Senator Paul Betancourt. He was elected to the Senate in 2014, and he's the chair of the Senate Committee on Property Tax um, and serves as a Senate Finance Education and Higher Education Committees. He also serves as the chair of the Texas Senate Republican Caucus and has been named to the Redistricting Committee. He, prior to that, he served 10 years as the Harris County Tax Assessor Collector, which is what gives you the incredible kind of insight and expertise on this issue as well, turned it into a smart government and one that was focused on customer service. Um, you, of course, we all worked together to pass uh, Senate Bill 2, sure. and uh, I'm sure in, in part, thanks to that, you were named Senate MVP by Capital Inside and Bull of the Brazos by Texas Monthly. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Uh, Chairman Dustin Burroughs, he was elected in uh, 2014 as well. Were you guys all elected? Okay, you were all elected in 2014. It was a very good year. It yeah. was. <laughs> yes, it was. So, it's you, called conservative reinforcement. That's right. Okay, that's what, what was required. He, uh, of course, chair, uh, chairs the House Ways and Means Committee and is a member of the House Committee on Elections and the Legislative Audit Committee. He's a small business owner practicing law at Burroughs Law Firm in Lubbock, uh, mostly representing agricultural producers. You graduated, and then you guys both graduated from Tech Law School. Mm -hmm. Is that that's right? right. Yep. So we have lots of similarities on this stage. Before a and had one. Before a and okay. that's right. Uh, you would have made the right decision, never mind. Uh, Chairman Burroughs, thank you for being here. And last but certainly not least, Representative Andrew Murr, elected in 2014 to, district, to serve District 53 in the Texas House. Um, he was appointed as one of only two House members to the Texas Judicial Council. Uh, this appointment also names him to the Texas Indigent Defense Commission. He has served on, of course, many, many committees, including a Transportation Committee, Culture, Recreation, and Tourism Committee, Rules and Resolutions Committee, and more. And he attended, it hurts me to say this as a Texas Longhorn, but uh, you did attend Texas A&M University. Woo! Absolutely. Come on, we can do better. Woo! I didn't want to give you that opportunity, but I guess I had no choice. Well, if Kevin can give me that opportunity, you have to. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for being here today, Representative Murr. So, okay, let's, let's set the stage really quickly um, and, and tell me, let's start with Chairman Burroughs. Can you tell me kind of why property taxes was a priority for the legislature this session? What is the lay of the land um, on the ground for taxpayers and why was it something that you were so determined to, to reform? Yeah, so I mean, obviously probably the number one uh, constituent complaint that I get in my office, most of my colleagues, is rising property taxes, how much they feel disconnected, lack of control over that. Um, and I'll, I don't mind sharing the story. So when I first was uh, appointed as the chair of Ways and Means, I went to go see Senator Betancourt, realizing this was a you know project and SB2 was his bill and it was such a big thing. And I promised him, I said, I will do my best to pass the most conservative version of your bill out of the House possible. And um, I truly believe, while not perfect and it has its issues, it was the most conservative version of your bill we could get out of the Texas House. And um, what's really exciting, I think, to see you know, over the coming year or two is does it do what we believe it will do? And I think it will. You know, are we going to see people more engaged? Are we going to see uh, property taxes reined in where there's actually going to be spending restraints? Um, and so I think that we'll start seeing this coming year and year after year as we start to monitor it, uh, the stuff that you promised and you thought was going to happen actually come into effect. And, you know, finally, property taxpayers got something big this session. So very mm -hmm. proud to work with you and get that done. Well, and I know, uh, you know, uh, it, from Austin's perspective, with the, with the previous rollback rate of 8% year over year, property taxes were double, on track to double every nine years. Sure. And that's just so unsustainable. So I, yeah. I think that where we are now, um, which why don't you tell us, Senator Betancourt, kind of just briefly what, what Senate Bill 2 did. Where are we now? Well, I was going to have some handouts. Never mind. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's the typical Betancourt MO. Okay, so that's right. But when he walked in, here's your handout. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's right. But I, you bring up Austin, by the way. And you know what? I already know the bill is working because the panic among some of the uh, taxing entities is preposterously high mm -hmm. because what happened here is after five years of good behavior um, you know Travis County decided to juice their rate uh, and uh, City of Austin is always there going to the maximum of the rollback rate mm -hmm. no matter what this pattern 
existed around the state, uh, El Paso actually raised their tax rates by 10 pennies, more than the ISD cut them uh, because of HB3. And we saw pockets of this in Wichita Falls and, and the county, Bryan College Station, all around the state where people were trying to get ahead of SB2. So quite frankly, I already know that SB2 has teeth because of, of people's actions. Well, I want to make a comment on that. I think that a lot of our uh, tax rating, uh, you know, tax setting officials who got elected went to conferences and were told they needed to do this, that they needed to get ahead of this and, you know, max it out and things like that. And that's a very frustrating thing. And hopefully during some of the hearings we have in the interim, we'll discover exactly what they were encouraged to be doing and see what happened and come back with some reports on that. Well, because, you know, um, and Chairman Burroughs is being slightly nice, I'll be less nice because when you see videos that come out of the Texas Association of Counties and Texas Municipal League, and they star Paul Betancourt, Charles Perry, and Brandon Creighton, you got there too late to be in the video, yep. apparently. Um, <laughs> I'll it, be in next year's You'll version. be in next yes, year's yeah. for sure. It, it just tells you that we've lost the focus of what government should be about, which is government should be doing essential services and always keeping their taxpayers' ability to pay as part of their discussion, okay? Um, and that has, we've lost some of that focus because the hearings that you had, the mm -hmm. hearings that I've had, the hearings that Representative Murr have been in, I won't tell you how many times we had people for years come in and say, I'm not raising your taxes because I'm not raising your rate, okay? I mean, as far back as, um, you know, uh, I see David Shoemaker when he was, you know, a, a staffer for me, you know, we've seen, we saw that attitude. Now, here's the good news. That attitude's broken, okay? Because the people that tried to go and, and juice the tax rates have taken a big hit for it, okay? And I'm gonna point to Harris County, Lubbock County, okay? Where the commissioners that necessarily weren't in favor of property tax relief, I, I, I have a big laugh with this about, you know, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, because we've been fighting this battle for 16 years. But two of them in Lubbock County mm -hmm. walked out of the meeting and said, I'm not going to set a tax rate. And that saved taxpayers some money uh, in Lubbock County. But let me ask you, so you... Well, hold on, let me finish. Oh. Then I'll get off my, my <laughs> subject. Because it's really important about Harris County. In Harris County, actually, one commissioner who was never for tax relief in the 30 years I've known him walked out with another one mm -hmm. and saved four pennies on every on every, every, every property tax account in the, in the entire county, that's $186 million. Just because they challenged the, their, their conservative colleagues, their conservative colleagues left because they knew they needed to have this vote now before SB2 started. And so that's probably gonna save everybody in that county well over $100 million in perpetuity because they'll never be able to get that money back that they wanted. And it was a, a pure fight of socialism. And I'm not saying this, you know, uh, I'm not saying this to try to light up the crowd, but when a socialist county judge says, I have no reason except I want the money, no plan to spend the money, except we need it. That was the entire justification for overtaxing people 186 uh, million. So we've actually, I think, got off to a good start with the bill. But how, so, so why was the decision made to delay implementation for a year? Because it, you could have made it effective immediately or in this budget cycle kind of cutting off their ability to go to that maximum tax rate and to, and to taxpayers that much more this time. So, so what, why was the decision made to make it okay, effective this, this year? This, this is the reason why I accepted the Legacy Award just like winners did in the 101st Airborne. Okay, it's not that one person's a hero, it's that we serve with a, a whole company of heroes. Here's why. We didn't have the votes to get a two-thirds majority when we started. We weren't even close, okay? Um, if it hadn't been for Lieutenant Governor Patrick's absolute insistence that he was gonna move the blocker bills, and it, he, whatever it took, that bill was not to come out of the Senate. And I will tell you that if that bill hadn't come out, HB3 wouldn't have passed. Correct. Because he knows we were, I mean, we were stuck for two months after. Mm -hmm. but, but he was 100% committed to passing that bill, whatever it took. Now, so, so when we go back and look at it, that took, 
as the chairman of the Republican caucus, we didn't have any Democrat votes at the time. We did end up with two, which was Senator Lucio and Senator Hinojosa. But we had to rely on just Republican votes to get it to the floor with mm -hmm. 60%. And that took Senator Seliger suspending but voting no on the bill. Now, he later also voted for the bill. So you can't start off. There's no way to do a quick implementation when you can't you don't have a shot at least a two-thirds vote. Okay. Yeah. I, I, did, I did not feel when we filed and started with the bill we had the votes to even pass it. I mean, it took a lot of behind-the-scenes work, and I know at the end of the day we got the votes to get it done. But, and, and, and Andy, feel free to jump in, I don't believe that every Republican was really for SB2 at the end of the day. And I think some you know, finally got on board at the end for whatever reasons, but a lot of them did not want to pass that. So on that topic, Representative Murr, how has, how has the bill been received by your local elected officials and, and by your taxpayers? I mean, we heard so much during session the, the sky is going to fall, we're not going to be able to afford critical city services, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that it hasn't quite, you know, gone into full effect yet, but are they still, are you still hearing that same pushback or are people kind of realizing that there is a way to live within our means and, and, and to live with a three and a half percent pay raise every year? So Ellen, I represent 12 rural districts or rural counties in my district. And uh, some of the county or city budgets that you have there are literally a million dollars or a couple of million dollars. And so for them, uh, really they do, they work diligently to pinch pennies because they don't really have staff. Mm -hmm. They wear multiple hats. Um, and, and so I've heard both sides of the coin from my local elected officials. Uh, the ones that, that were very concerned, they've been able to hold the line. They haven't had uh, challenges with implementation yet. And they feel like that they're going to, they're going to come out okay. Uh, there were others that they've been running their local, their local budget like a business from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And while mm -hmm. you come along and say, hey, we don't all normally go up that high. That was always a safety net if we, if we found a justifiable reason. We don't have those reasons right now. But if we have a wildfire or a, a major uh, catastrophe, we sure hope the state and the federal government are going to be there to help us. Uh, we're going forward. And so for the most part, you have seen them make it work. Mm. And I think from the constituent side, um, we've been very engaged with our constituents because that's the number one phone call you get in the fall is my taxes are going up. What are you going to do about it? And so we've been able to turn around and say, you have information on where to go and who to talk to. And we're, we're, we're eager to make sure that you are engaged in that process. So at the end of the day, you've either understand what you're spending money on and you're, you're excited and happy about it or you, you have engaged your local elected officials and you've changed the course mm -hmm. of proposed action. Yeah, let me make another side. I've got some rural counties as well. And I remember I'd be getting phone calls from some of my uh, small county judges or some that in the neighboring area. And they'd say, you know, Dustin, I want to work with you. You know, we've got some ideas. We think we can make this work, you know, so that both some of the small budgets and big budgets can do things. I said, well, great, come on, let's get out there. You can help me and do this. I said, well, you know, I made a posting and uh, somebody from my association called me and yelled at me and cursed at me. And I just, I just can't do that. I can't break the line. And uh, that's a real frustrating thing that, you know, I, I get to sometimes get the sense that we would have had more buy-in from some of our county judges and commissioners. We had some good buy-in from some. I mean, not everyone was against it, but we would have had more if they didn't feel that their associations made them toe the line, kind of like a union. Well, and, and let me, I have an excerpt here from what they were directed to say during this whole process. Oh, please, all, I haven't heard this. All our testimony should focus on the negative consequences of revenue caps on our citizens without producing any tax relief. Not caps. Uh, they, this is their words, not mine. Yeah. Uh, a revenue cap will seriously damage public safety, economic development, and transportation, and property taxes will continue to rise because of school district taxes, the real cause of high property taxes in Did Texas. <laughs> <laughs> will continue yeah, to escalate. Okay. The bottom line of our message is that legislators will get no credit for reducing taxes and all the blame for everything cities can't afford to do. They really tapped into your egos there. Mm. You're going to get blamed. You're going to get blamed. So, uh, so that you're, you're right. I mean, that was the message that they were receiving, and um, and many local elected officials were hesitant to speak up. Yeah. Do okay. you? So, so, so now that it has passed. Are they coming around? I, I, I think there's some light here in the tunnel because there's two things that are happening. 
this is a phased implementation because really what people are seeing this year is HB3, which has you know, a 7% M&O cut rate. And I've had a lot of people stop me and they really appreciate that because sure. that was finally, they saw some break in their tax bills and that's why I credited uh, Chairman Huberty and, and Senator Taylor on that too uh, in, the, in the other room. Now, the real big parts of SB2 that people haven't yet come to grips with is that if you need more money, government go to the voters and get it. Right. And I challenge anybody in the room that if they need a bulldozer or whatever it is, take it to November and let people vote on it. Because see, that was the key thing. I know it attracted Governor Abbott's attention earlier. He picked, that was something he really <coughs> grabbed immediately was the, the power of that vote. Mm -hmm. And also him going to two and a half percent helped us stretch everything down. Now, um, but so that's the key thing. Now there's tremendous transparency reforms because everybody's gonna have a portal to look at the tax rate setting process and emails for local officials so people can actually begin the conversation because it was too easy to hide behind the appraisal district. I'm not raising your taxes. I don't know where this money's coming from. I don't know what we're spending it with. It's not my problem. See somebody else. Well, that's going to change this fall. Okay. And there's some pretty, you know, um, over the top responses. I'll let uh, 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 the chairman Burroughs talk about one, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to that. And there's appraisal reforms in here too, because uh, we just had the appraisal uh, advisory committee set. Uh, we're looking at standardized bit processes, manuals. We've done term limits for ARB. Uh, there's a whole raft of things that were involved in that, plus about three dozen other property tax bills that passed both our committees and uh, uh, and did. But it took. Uh, but so we've got a lot of reform coming. People have seen the first step this year, and I think people will get used to this because look, no offense. Three and a half percent plus new growth plus first time homestead exemptions. Listen, there's almost any conservative uh, budget can run under that. And if you need more, go to the voters and get a vote. Austin, can I just 30 seconds? I got a call, I forget from what news agency. They're, they want to take the MO rate because they want to do some type of transportation gig with trains. And they want to go vote more money for tr transportation tracks on streets. And I reminded the person who was interviewing me that you can't, that's, you'll have to go back every year and vote. And, there, and the response back from the city's people was, well, we're only looking for 60 to $80 million. We can do it all in one shot, okay? See, we're still going to be fighting these real liberal tax and spend, and I say socialism at times. But that's part of what we fight. But... SB2 puts the taxpayers in the driver's seat because they get to vote in November. Okay. So, Chairman, do you think that you will see more rollback elections? So that's a great question. We're watching one right now where someone got under the petition requirement. I hope we do. I mean, this is what the idea is, is to give people more control. If we see more rollback elections, I think it's great we're having the conversation. One of the things I'm also going to monitor is, I mean, the voter approval rate is great. The visibility part is another really key component, and I want to see what type of feedback, you know, our mayors and county judges are actually getting. You know, they're going to be an auto-populated form where people can actually ask questions, do things, and I think some really good grassroots, you know, organizers and people who care about things can kind of get this information, extrapolate it, push it, and get people more engaged, and the more we're talking about tax rates and property taxes and what actually revenues they're generating, uh, that's a great conversation to be having. Mm. And Representative Murr, you had a, a little bit different take on property tax reform this last session. Um, I would love for you to tell us about your bill, House Bill 297, uh, what, it, what it would have done, why, why it's important, and, and what, we, what can we expect going sure. forward? So, so again, I go back, I come from the Hill Country. Uh, you have a lot of small towns, typically you'll have one or two towns in a, in a county and not a lot of people. When you sit down and if you look at a pie chart, that constitutes how much those property taxpayers are paying on average and across the state through the comptroller's office, you'll see that about half of all property taxes before these reforms were put in place uh, constituted public education funding. And so we would deal with phone calls, my staff and I, on a very frequent basis where people complain about their property taxes. And we're, we're polite, we listen, and then we remind them that the state of Texas, it doesn't assess or collect a property tax, local governments do. 
But in that same vein, if you look to the Texas Constitution, you see that Texas is also charged with providing uh, free public education for our youth. And you go back and you look at that pie chart and you say, well, half of what everybody's paying is for public education. Now, I also represent over 30 school districts and a third of those before wow. what we implemented were paying into the Robin Hood program. So they're property wealthy districts. Uh, for whatever reason, they're sending money to the state of Texas uh, to then be redistributed uh, across the state. And there's a lot of frustration whenever you talk to those school administrators. So I just wanted to blow it up and start over. And I've used that term over and over again. Uh, when you talk about Robin Hood, uh, HB 297 basically proposed to abolish M&O school property taxes as we know it and do away with Robin Hood as we know it, which we haven't effectively gotten rid of it. It's something that was there 25 years ago as a Plan B in May of 1993, throwing you know, it was a Hail Mary pass to come up with a way to fund education. And since then, we've kind of stuck with it. And I don't like telling my constituents, well, you know, you're going to have to live within the framework of what we've dreamed up. If there's a better way to do that, that's good. So my proposal was essentially to abolish M&O for schools. That's about $25 billion a year on average. And we've got to come up with a way to pay, uh, to pay for it because I'm not looking at trying to cut public education. That's a separate discussion that you need to have. And so the lower hanging fruit was something like a consumption tax to investigate, could we pay for that with a sales tax increase? What would that do? Are there other revenue sources or streams out there? And that, in effect, was what we want policymakers to talk about. And so that's what 297 was to do. Certainly a good way to start the conversation. Well, I stir the pot. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the good news. Uh, we did pass that bill, but the interim charges include a charge of reducing or eliminated school district M&O. Yes. And so, you know, this is a great thing for, you know, Ellen and the entire Public Policy Foundation. We'll take testimony on any good ideas out there to how to make a significant reduction, how to transition less reliant on property taxes to presumably more consumption-based thing. And so the ideas that come up with, as long as it's, you know, revenue neutral, I think that we'd love to hear them uh, hopefully in September, October-ish. Well, but here's the good news with all of this, yeah. okay? That when you look at a hard cap, because the, the school 2.5% really is a hard cap, okay, effectively. By the way, when you look at it on a district-by-district district basis, people are finally going to get the relief they need, which is as values go up, tax rates are going to come down and come down substantially. Uh, we had five billion, five point one billion dollars worth of property tax relief on just that portion of, uh, of that's coming to taxpayers over the next biennium. About a billion, roughly, I think through 2024 on one estimate on just SB2. But what, what is also happening is our sales taxes are continuing to grow. Our last uh, you know, our last uh, month, I think, was 6% up, the prior year about 7 or 8. And sales, uh, severance tax is off the charts at this point in time due to the whopping you guys out in West Texas. You know, you can claim the Permian, you might as well, okay? Uh, because the productivity increase is astonishing. Even the estimates I did were based about 4.7 million barrels a day, and we're over five. So as long as we don't think that we can spend the money at high volume and high price, which is what sunk Oklahoma when they tried to do their school tax change, I mean their school finance reform based on that, uh, I think we've got good robust growth in the economy uh, to continue to collect uh, the revenue we need to cover what we've already put together in SB, uh, excuse me, in HB3 from the state side. So. I really want to get to, so what, what is next? I mean, obviously there are some other ideas out there blowing up the system, starting all over again. <laughs> um, but what, but what, after the legislative session, uh, the Lieutenant Governor went on, went on record saying, we will eliminate any loopholes designed to circumvent the property tax reforms in Senate Bill 2 in the next legislative session. So have those loopholes emerged yet? Are there things that, um, that you're already kind of planning on. I, I, and I'm particularly curious about certificates of ob obligation. Oh, if you... you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, he was saying CO, CO, CO. He was whispering CO in my yeah. ears. Which, what, uh, what, what, what is a certificate of obligation? Yeah, so it's a non-voter approved way of actually getting debt. And so you're looking at the rollback calculations. Debt is not counted against the rollback rate. And uh, I championed and did not get it through this time that you should treat voter approved debt and non-voter approved debt very differently because it's ripe for abuse. And so hopefully we'll take a hard look at what's going on with COs. I'm afraid that is a big loophole that's actually in the system in the calculation. 
and uh, make sure that payments towards COs is part of the rollback rate calculation, not excluded from that. Hmm. But we're going to have to monitor it and see. There may be other loopholes and things out there. I do believe it's going to be a, uh, there's not a silver bullet solution to what we're talking about. It's kind of a game of whack-a-mole in part of, you know, interim hearings is going through and figuring out, you know, what's actually going on and what do we need to do to tweak and adjust to make sure it has its intended effect and taxpayers get the control they so desperately deserve. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, well, part of this is, and Andy can, you know, speak to this too, is you, you're, Texas is an enormous state granularity wise. You've got urban counties that are, you know, have a half a trillion dollar tax roll and mm -hmm. you've got some counties that are lucky to have $20 million of tax roll. So when you're looking at a state, when you try to do a one size fits all solution, you, you, you have a, you're always gonna have granularity issues. And I appreciate Chairman Burroughs comments about passing the most conservative version of SB2. We had just worked on it a couple of sessions before sure. you got there. And so there's, there's a lot of jurisdictions that aren't covered by a mm -hmm. lot, especially the special taxing jurisdictions right. are not. And those have the highest growth curve, even higher than mm -hmm. um, the cities and the counties uh, and much less the schools. But again, what we saw long term on, on growth of, of taxes was the schools were, uh, you could make it either 4.5 or 5% roughly growth rate per year. Well, that's, that's cut in half. And that means that the state's going to have to come out of pocket significantly because, it, because of Robin Hood and the other expenditures that are related to that. But this was always important because the curves were going in a direction that were impossible to sustain. Uh, we were going to have $5 billion worth of, uh, of Robin Hood transfers within five years. Uh, the, uh, you know, and so doing both education reform and tax reform, uh, because the tax bill was 120 pages, the education bill is over 300. There's a lot to watch because you've got to, to do the right public policy, what gets measured gets fixed. And we've got a ton of stuff to measure We've got, uh, in my committee alone, we've got a charge to look at what were effectively 2,000 taxing jurisdictions to see if we're gonna uh, monitoring compliance. Um, because unfortunately, uh, everyone has a different view of what compliance is. I can only, you know, it, it only use reference the city of Austin as one, you know, possible, you know, uh, you know outlier that you have to check on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. so, so some of the, the details in the bill, I mean, there were, it, obviously, the big change was going from 8% tax increase year over year to 3.5%. To and, and automatic. It, and, and yes, and the automatic, and the automatic, yeah, automatic yeah. election instead of a petition to, to have that vote. But there were some other details like, um, let's see, uh, the, the smaller, well, the smaller, some smaller cities uh, still have the petition process in place, right? Um, there's a three year banking for any un unused rollback increment so if you only go up to so percent if you're one good year for a while, you, can, you can blow it in uh -huh, the last year and right I'm, I'm like chip and and you know and dan <laughs> some of the things that we have to do are necessarily not what we really want to do but what it takes to get a bill passed so do you so that, <laughs> yeah, well but, and that that was my question i mean the the do you think um you struck the right chord there in order to do what you needed to do to get the bill passed or do you see some of those details uh being renegotiated so look, I mean, to get, to, to get the bill passed, you have to have 76 votes. And we knew kind of what you had to do to get 76 votes on there. You know, the Senate had a $15 million carve out with an automatic vote. Um, we ended up with a $500,000 de minimis exception, which really meant it was a $6 million budget. But of course, up to $6 million, there's a huge potential sure. issue there. We layered it on top of being able to not go above 8% with the petition. A lot of complicated things. The bill, we kept trying to make it more conservative at the end of the day but there was always going to be something for smaller taxing jurisdictions. Otherwise, we never would have gotten to the 76 votes needed. Right, wrong, or otherwise, mm -hmm. that's what you had to do to get the bill actually moved. Can, can I do a little okay. shout out here? I want to make, because yeah. you, you said that Texas is a big state and the Senator's exactly correct. So we have 254 counties. You know, I live in a town which up until recently had one stoplight. We have three now, so we consider ourselves blessed. But I, I'm not sure that's progress. I, it's, yeah, it might, it might not. It's safety. So, but but my, my point is, I live in a town small enough that we personally know your elected officials, and I can see them at the grocery store or the Friday night football game, and I can ask them specific questions, and we can have that relationship. It is a lot harder to do in high population areas such as Harris County 
And because there are more people and there's more layers of bureaucracy to get to them, it is harder for you to have that frank discussion. And so what you'll find is in a very small town uh, or a small community, you, you can, they can dig down to the, to the details pretty quickly. And I think that's a little bit of a distinction on small budgets. So. Well, it's, it's important to recognize that there's, a, I mean, Texas is a big place. My wife was laughing about this, Andy, because I can't go to a grocery store or a restaurant without somebody coming up and immediately engaging about property tax, where we're going. Um, and that's, you know, pretty much all over Southeast Texas at this point. Now, to, but to the, the point about this, I think that in a couple years, this is just going to become old hat, okay? Because it's always that first year of change that people are so worried mm -hmm. about. TAC and TML put up a huge fight for five years on this. Um, but because the state bird of Texas is no longer just the mocking crane, it's the construction crane, it, it, this growth starts with urban areas, hits smaller cities, hits suburban, and then hits rural, okay? And it's everywhere. By the time that occurs, SB2 and HB3 will have been running in the background for a couple of years. So as values go up, rates are gonna come down and that's gonna become the norm again. See, look, we became, I don't know, we, we were idiots for chasing New Jersey and Illinois to be the top tax rates in the country, okay? Because it's unsustainable. The good news is we've already hit our peak and we're headed back down. And whereas a lot of other states will take our place because they're gonna chase that, that large, you know, that large revenue. And, and look, um, the problem that I see in local government, and, and you did a lot of work on this when you were on the city council, mm -hmm. okay, she did, is if you treat the money as your money, mm -hmm. you think of it, the three of us think of that differently than the person that expects all that money to come and they want 10% more to come every year. And that does double tax bills in seven years. I can remember when then Senator Patrick went out and said, you know, in 2006, these tax bills are going to double in seven years, and then they're going to double again in another seven years if we don't do something about it. Well, he was pretty right at the time. The media thought we were all crazy advocating tax relief. But, um, but the good news is I think over time everybody will get used to the system. And look, you know, take, if you need something, go to the voters. Let them approve it. That's the real huge change in the bill. Because that's not something that happens except in a few states, New Hampshire and others around the country. And I, I love that part of the change. We're now in a, you know, in a, um, uh, in a, in a, in a, effectively in a November general election mode. And I think that's a fabulous place for the taxpayers to be. Right. So we've, we've brought up the, the issue of taxpayer funded lobbying a couple times, although maybe not so directly. Do you think that, um, TML and I mean from the from my perspective on the on the city council we were spending nearly a million dollars on just contract lobbyists just contract lobbyists that doesn't even include our internal whole government relations team or the rent that they were the tens of thousands of dollars that they were spending on rent to run an office downtown even though city council is just a few blocks from the capitol um, I mean they were they were a major force in this bill do you think do you think um, that the that the reforms could have been stronger without uh, without such opposition from taxpayer funded lobbyists? And do, and do you do you think, I think that it could have been sooner? <laughs> well, that's true. Do, do you think that going forward, talking about the other reforms that you're hoping to make in the in the coming future, and, and Representative Mert, you too? I mean, be curious to, to know what you think that their impact is going to be on um, on your bill as well. I mean, what 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 how should we be thinking about how they play into this whole situation? So I think one of the first things that we have to do is start educating people about what their taxpayer dollars are being used for. I do not believe, having talked to many constituents and people I represent, that they understand that their tax dollars are being taken and being spent to lobby against their interest, mm -hmm. being lo spent lobbying against sanct or for sanctuary cities, against the oil and gas industry on fracking. Um, for raising the minimum wage and doing you know, harmful things or keeping that, and all these other issues and against property tax reform. And so I think there, while I think most people are probably in this room and in the Austin bubble kind of understand what that is, 
we haven't gone out there and explained that enough to people. And when they hear that, and I, you know, and we actually, they understand it, they're pretty offended by it, to be real honest with you. And I've tried my best to educate people back home in Lubbock. You know, this is what's happening. This is what, you know, is going on. And, you know, if the mayor wants to talk to me, pick up the phone and give me a call. He doesn't need a lobbyist to come down there and do that. That's representative government. You know, look, when I can remember one of our hearings. We had some quite some interesting, you know, uh, interesting discussion. But one small city brought 12 employees. They came all day, okay? It was everybody from the police chief to the fire chief to the mayor to the general city manager, et cetera. And, um, and they uh, would just come because they, they read the script that they were supposed to read. And when you started questioning them, okay, well, you mean you can't set priorities in your life? No, we, we can do that. Um, are you sure that what you're being read is true? Well, I'm not 100% sure. Look, with everything, this is a, a problem because I think there's over $100 million, maybe $200 million of lobbying. I actually had a bill that would have put all that on the, te te the Texas ethics uh, site. And the House was trying to come back with a ban bill, and then it, I think it failed, if I remember correctly. I just love to know how much money we're talking about. I, I think it could be as high as a quarter billion dollars. Mm. And, and when that type of money is being spent on your capital, it means that that's got to be money that's being spent against taxpayers, because there's no other way to explain the magnitude. And uh, I, I think that TPPF actually did some calculations, some and it was well. I, I remember a statistic that it was 11, all of all the total money spent on lobbying at the Capitol, 11 percent of it came from taxpayers, which has to be millions and millions of dollars. Well, if you look over biennium, that could be 100. You know, like yeah. I said, it could be 100 million a year. And look, we have to stop this. Okay, it, we don't need that type of lobbying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. See. The whole fight about SB2 for years was, are you going to do the right thing? Are you going to tax your homes and your businesses out of the state? You're going to be taxed out of town, to quote my namesake from BOMA over there. That was, they used that first. Or are you going to be able to say, we can slow down and make decisions within a reasonable budget and take the excess if we need it to the public and vote for it? Well. That's pretty common sense, but it took five years and a knockdown drag out. And again, um, I, you know, I, I really appreciate Chairman Burroughs being able to pass the bill, but I have to take my hat off to my band of brothers, the 19 senators, the Republicans and Lieutenant Governor Patrick, because we fought that battle for four years mm -hmm. and we had every lobbyist, paid lobbyist against us. But I knew we had won, and my committee chair knows this, David Clark, that the last hearing we had in February, when we were accelerating and you didn't know why we were doing it, mm -hmm. you're right, <laughs> okay. Not a single regular taxpayer came and avoid, uh, opposed the bill. It was only people that were paid by taxpayer lobbyists to oppose it. We had hundreds of people, a hundred more people testify for it because people were just desperate to get out of it. And in Austin, what I'm, what I'm amazed at is that there hasn't been more of a fight in the progressive left versus you know other you know other parts of the political establishment because it, it, we're talking about gentrification. We're sitting in gentrification on the east side of Austin right now, and and we did get you. How many people? How many Democrats voted for the bill? Six in the House. At the end of the day, I don't have the numbers, but there was there were several. Yeah, right. and we had two senators that did it. Now they they took a lot of guff for crossing the line, and one's in a primary race right now. And one of his, it's, he stands up and proudly says, hey, we, you know, I helped on your property taxes. So I, I, as, as more of the body politic understands good public policy is good politics too, I think this will be, have a good outcome in years to come. And I'm gonna add something from a policy perspective. So when we talk about taxpayer funded lobbying, uh, I can go to any person that's a constituent on the street and have a discussion. And when you say, for example, the city of Austin, you said spends approximately a million dollars a year to hire people who go and lobby most people understand that but when i have a discussion depending on how broad a a legislative net is cast uh does that also affect the dues for the uh the county attorney or the district attorney that they pay into their association because they're supposed to be busy prosecuting cases and when we as members turn around and say well where are the prosecutors on a proposed change in law 
they do have an entity that shows up and says, well, we, you know, we've kind of talked to our, our members and they support this change or they're against it. And we also value that input in the process. So having that policy discussion in the future, we've got to say, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of spending a bunch of money and hiring a bunch of lobbyists. That, that doesn't make any sense. But if I want to keep my prosecutor in court working and they're going to pay 100 bucks or whatever their dues is to an organization that provides some insight, we have to have that discussion. And I represent, I think, 17 different prosecutors, so I, I, I hear from them frequently. Are you friends with 17 different Yes, people? they all have my cell phone number. You're right. No, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's an example that, that depending on how you shape that policy, it can actually influence uh, uh, many different organizations that don't necessarily, they're not active, they're there as a resource for, for, for some of us in, in the legislature. But I'll go back, and I think this is the frustration for you know a guy out in Lubbock, Texas. I know my county judges, I know my prosecutors, and you know if my county judge has an issue, he can pick up the phone, call me, and I can represent him and represent the interests mm -hmm. of the issues down here. I get frustrated when they all go off into you know the Texas Association of Counties meetings and for three days they're inundated with here's how you shake the money tree here's the message you need to deliver and next thing you know i'm getting a phone call that basically is the same talking points over and over and over and over again and i know it's our tax dollars that have funded this prop you know propaganda and i start wondering who's really representing who i mean are you know is 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 mm. somehow some of my county mm -hmm. judges just mm -hmm. basically on the talking points of tack and it's really this you know austin driven bureaucracy that's basically controlling what the agenda is or is it really about what they think is best for our area and well, that i guess can be very frustrating and that i guess that'll be a, a legislative discussion that will will live to see another day well we're running short on time um, but i do want to ask one last question i want a, a a prediction and maybe one sentence or two as as to why um, what Trump impeachment? Or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then we'll then we'll really be here. Well, uh, so will will we ever get to a place where we have no property taxes in Texas? Um, well, not to, to spoil everybody's future. You know, it's going to be difficult because look, there's only three uh, three stools roughly that you can that you can get revenue from. You got property taxes. I mean, three three legs to one stool. You got a property tax. You've got a consumption sales tax and you've got an income tax. Now, we are fortunately in a situation where we've got strong severance tax. And one of the things that I've been talking about, and I know, you know uh, both Representative Mur and Burroughs that have seen this, back in the school um, uh, finance committee, we started talking about severance taxes and the fact that our um, ESF fund is effectively gonna overflow now to, into the future. I don't think that we should have a sovereign wealth fund in Texas. So before we jump on another leg of the stool like income tax or something else, I wanna make sure that we use the revenue that we've got coming in um, that's, that's going to be here uh, for some time. Um, and, uh, but, um, but the good news is- So that's a no. That's a, right, to zero, no. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you this, we got further, farther, and better mm -hmm. because I never, when, I remember one ice day that you weren't there, but we were down in Houston. I think David was there, and I see Mike uh, was also there, Morrissey, where the governor decided we're going to go to two and a half on schools. Well, by God, we hit two and a half on schools. Took a lot of work, um, but it was a huge advantage to Lieutenant Governor to pass that bill because we got down to two and a half. People never thought we would yeah. get to two and a half. That's true. And, and five, uh, two and a half is a lot closer to 0% growth than. Uh, than anybody ever thought we could get to. Quickly, never say never. Um, but I think it was good, the good work of you know, Andy Murr and his bill and others, I think there's a real opportunity to reduce our dependence on property taxes um, and have an honest conversation about how to make a substantial reduction there. And in front of both of these chairmen, I'll tell you, I'll be back again with legislative proposals to abolish MO school property taxes. Uh, that is a huge hit. And it won't go to zero, but it certainly changes the game on how we fund education. And when you look at your pocketbooks, you'll, an entire generation of folks will see a fundamental change in how much they pay in property taxes. So that's my goal. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, we have uh, some time. Well, I just want to thank you guys first before we go to questions for for that discussion. I I don't know policy ta or property taxes. It's just I could talk about it forever. So thank you so much for um, for the work that all of you guys have done to to tackle this really pressing issue. 
Um, and I, I look forward to seeing what else we're going to come up with in well, the next legislative session. Well, especially we filled up the room for you. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, that's true. That's true. Okay. Um, so we have a, a microphone, and just raise your hand, and he will come around and what, see what kind of questions you guys have for our panelists here. First of all, first of all, thank you. Uh, you did a masterful job. It was like watching an orchestra leader. Every time those uh, cities and counties came, I was witness and I testified at the Senate, uh, Senate hearings how you were so quick to, before they could even get to their criticism, you, you already knew that they were from wherever. You're right. Their rates <laughs> went up, so what, it, was, it was entertaining to the point of embarrassing to those people. But I'll, I'll direct, redirect this question to Representative Muir. The government of education, which we don't call it, which it should be called the government of education, is is based on, as you said, the state's constitution, which says we're supposed to efficiently fund public education. Doesn't even say fairly, but let's just throw that in for, for goodwill. How do we rationalize 1,250 school districts that refer to themselves as independent when actually every session they come to y'all as codependent as any child, and yet we continue to look away from, and I'm from Bear County, the, the source of the, the, the expression wealth discrimination, where we have 17 independent school districts. I, and I, I, I'm asking, I'm pleading, I'm, I'm, I'm offering you talking points. Wealth discrimination is the expression that was brought up in 1968. It made its way to the Supreme Court, and except for the federal government saying it's the state's responsibility, we can't point to either side of the aisle that we've ever addressed the inefficiency. I'm a CPA. 1,250 school districts, 150 state reps. The lieutenant governor said 18 million people came here in 18 years. We didn't need more state reps. Why? And we didn't increase the number of school districts. <laughs> why, why is it that we aren't abdicating for a reduction? And let's put it back where it belongs, in y'all's hands. Because you're the elected officials who are supposed to fund public education. And I, that, I know that will that'll cost you your job. But maybe it needs to cost a few school district superintendents their jobs before them because they're not seeking to consolidate in the name of wealth discrimination. So if I may. Go ahead. Um, you, you, you make valid points, and those points have been made to me both by constituents, school board members, and sometimes administration. Uh, from a vantage point that I'll tell you, we, we are uh, at a place in Texas where we don't create new towns very often. You don't have new names that pop up like you did several generations back. Uh, we've got to a point, um, for lack of a better term, it's stabilized. You're not going to add or subtract many school districts. The issue that we have is the same thing fundamentally we have a discussion about education. You really have to bifurcate the discussion into where does the money come from? Let's have a detailed discussion about that. And then where does the money go? And then you have to have a separate discussion about that because there are a lot of folks that want to be stakeholders at that table. So given that, as long as we have a system that has some part of that being funded at the local level, the state of Texas can't levy a property tax to get there. And so one, they're going to need school districts, so yes, but do they need the quantity? No, there's a lot of folks who still think that the, they want to elect school board members so they can weigh in on anything from how they select cheerleaders uh, to how many, to how many, uh, seriously, that's a very big deal in some of the districts I represent, is how they, how they elect cheerleaders. My, my niece uh, uh, and my sister have to deal with that. Uh, or on, on the alternative, you know, how much focus do they want to give certain issues or matters in their school that they think are unique to their town? Then you get back to the rural part, and I don't know East Texas as well as I know West Texas, but, you know, for a lot of folks, Saturday night and Friday night, that is, the, that is literally the epiphany of what is important to them and their hometown. And so they are able to uh, idealize a hometown team mascot. Uh, they champion their, their children through that process, and they like to have that level of local control. So when you start talking consolidation, some of them feel like they lose that control. So until the state quits uh, funding through property taxes, I don't know that we can ever advocate consolidation. Now, Bear County, I have school districts, uh, for example, my hometown of Junction, Texas, UIL realignment, the high school has 182 students on average for this last cycle. That was the count. That's all they have. And it's, and it's shrinking because they're moving to different parts of the state. Uh, so different parts of the state are different than Northeast or others where it's thousands and they're constantly building new schools to keep up with the growth rate. 
There's not an easy answer. And I don't have an easy answer. And I don't know if these gentlemen do. Yes. Of course, scientists lose the enrollment of charter schools, and yet the wealth discrimination and the inefficiency of Southwest San Antonio and Bear County is never part of this conversation. I love and respect each and every one of you. I mean that sincerely. I'm president of the Christian Chamber. I don't have to. I, I, I do love you because of the, the positions you've advanced, but the, but the logic still lacks. And I come from a very blue county, oh. and it's wealth discrimination that we perpetuate. We, Bear County, mm -hmm. we're, we're the model. Thank you. I'll just make a quick comment. We need reform. I don't know what the solutions all is, but I'll tell you that sometimes I think that the Public Education Committee and the Ways and Means Committee ought to be combined because it's hard to separate those two. And sometimes mm. I think we work in isolation and independent in a way that we shouldn't. Mm. This was one of our first conservatives that showed up back at a hearing in San Antonio, back what seems to be an eon ago, okay, to speak for tax relief as a private citizen. That, and, and, but there's no question that what's gonna have to happen is you're gonna have to have consolidation eventually. Because look, we set up 254 counties because that was the where you could get a horse and a judge around to the circuit in one day, okay? We set up 1,200 school districts because that's what it took to get that initial wave of education done. Um, we're, we're going to see consolidation eventually uh, because it's, the inefficiencies are just too great. But part of it is there's a lot of lot of stuff in HB3. Boy, we could go on for a long time. A lot of reform there. We'll see how it works. Question over here. Yep. I can speak loudly. Um, so the, the, the mic helps just because okay. it's recorded too. Oh, it. So he's okay. he's making his way. So page one of HB3 it talks about the efficiency audit. Um, work with school finance. Mm -hmm. um, that's my job. We haven't heard a whole lot of details about that. Have y'all had conversation with the agency, with you know, additional policy organizations to try to get that shaped out? Uh, to answer your question, I've had a couple people call, give me some ideas of what the efficiency audits ought to look like, um, and you know, to the extent I get asked upon it, I'll certainly venture my uh, ideas. Uh, it, it's a great tool. Look, when I was a tax assessor, what was really eons ago, I actually asked for a performance review in my office. Because when I got there, we had literally no um, job descriptions, work instructions, organizational charts, training manuals of any type. And we were using a Boston banking ledger from the 19th century, and there, were no, there was no automation, and our one mainframe was Sanskrit, not COBOL. Now, that was 1998. Government gets way behind. And efficiency audits are okay, because look, the state has said, we're putting in $11 billion, into, you know, into education and we're, and we're doing five billion in property tax relief. Well, states ponied up and we're in. So let's make sure we're spending it wisely because I'd rather see the successes that we saw in, in Dallas and, you know, in the, in the, in the, some of the programs about more money going sure. to more teachers to, you know, to raise better scores for, you know, for, for kids. There's, there's a solution here, but you have to recognize the obvious. So I want them to have as, as strong of an efficiency audit as they can have. And I, I, um, you know, I got pretty deep into the weeds of efficiency audits in Austin because there was a referendum on the ballot to, to do one on the city of Austin uh, while I was in office that unfortunately didn't pass, but I have some ideas to. to Great. <laughs> it didn't pass, no, I yeah. can't imagine. I know, exactly. Mary posed it, shocking. We need, we need all of your money, but don't ask us what we're doing no, with no, it. No. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. Right over here. And then the well-dressed bow tie guy next to him. Thank you, mm -hmm. gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, a quick reminder that 10 or 20 years ago, I was involved in a uh, survey that asked if the people would support an income tax. It's not something you need to be as afraid of as you think. When given the question, would you support an income tax in Texas if we abolished the property tax, it was 65% yes. This is the late 90s, early 2s. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly when. When given the second choice, would you support a property tax, uh, an income tax to support education, but keep the property tax for other things, the answer was 42% yes. So the point being the people are smart enough to know the difference between whether you abolish a property tax or create another tax. Give us a choice, let us vote. Let us also vote on electing the chief appraiser 
the one person who has more control over your pocketbook than anyone else in the state, maybe even the IRS. The chief appraiser needs to be elected. Number two, put your cap on valuation. The corruption in Bear County, which is the laughing stock of the state of Texas, quoting my own representative Lyle Larson, those are his words. I missed that one. Wrong. We need <laughs> we we need to to limit the valuation process to the inflation rate, but never more than two percent a year. Thank you so much for doing what you did. It was a start. But you talk about wealth inequality, you look at the disparities in, in valuation of property across Bear County, it'll you, you just your head will explode. That's how bad it is. Mm. Can we can we vote on these things and can we do something uh, next session to cap the valuations year Some over year? Some of that year? stuff you talked about, Robert, is going to take a two-thirds vote, okay? Some of the things that we put everything we could in, and actually some of the thoughts I know Chairman Burroughs was advocating for it, so. Um, but, but again, um, it's not the value that kills you. It's when you get the bill and you have to pay it and you have no other recourse. Right. So the way the e literally to, I mean, this was a fight to take a camel and stick it in the eye of a needle, okay? Because that rollback rate was the one thing that we could get to, okay? Um, you know, uh, the, one, the one point that only took a majority vote that you could change a whole bunch of public policy and save everybody a bunch of money on their tax bills by touching that. Every, but almost everything else requires a constitutional amendment that you talked about. Well, let's vote. Yeah. And we well, can abolish the appraisal issue. Well, we don't have I and R, I, you know, because look, if we had an initiative referendum, we've already had a Proposition 13. It would have passed a decade ago. That, we, we have to get two thirds votes and that takes people from the other side of the aisle to vote for it as well. Hmm. Brian, I think you have one, there was one in the back too. Hey, that's my job. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm in talk show mode. Oh. I um, apologize, Ellen. No, that's okay. See, that, he reminds me Thanks. of Ron Wright, that good tax assessor that went on to be a congressman because he was for tax relief. Okay. Um, my question uh, is on taxpayer funded lobbying because it's so closely related to um, property tax reform. And I guess uh, I would ask um, your respective assessments in both chambers on how far we got on taxpayer funded lobbying reform this session and how we're looking going into next. And what would you say to one of the arguments I heard uh, from some of the locals was, hey, they elected us too. Uh, so, you know, we need to be able to, they're almost sort of triangulating their position against, you know, those who are seeking reform in the legislature saying, hey, the constituents elected us both. So uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Hmm. <laughs> you start? I mean, look, we made a few strides. Uh, I was a joint author of a bill to ban it completely. Um, went down, very surprising to me, when some Republicans joined with the Democrats to stop it on the What's House floor. Um, and uh, very Ours. disappointed by that, I, you know, there's no doubt about it. I do think that there's some more transparency needs at the very minimum because I want to start to see if, if we're not gonna ban the practice, which is what I want to see happen, which I've advocated for, we at least need to make sure we start down the path of educating people about what's actually going on because I think there'll be an outrage and eventually we'll get to a ban by doing that. Um, we're actually having the conversations, which is good. We've made some strides, but uh, we have some work to do. We had a um, portion of the bill that we passed out of the Senate, I think it was 27 to four about full disclosure. Mm -hmm got added to a Nelson, Chairman Nelson bill, and I, was it Caprioni that added? I can't remember mm -hmm. who added it. Okay. Geo. Yeah, Geo, okay. So we've got some transparency stuff that has started, okay? Uh, but we need to do more than that. Um, but to me, I always go with transparency first because what gets measured gets fixed. What you know how big the problem is? See, if, we, if I can walk, if, if I'm in a grocery store in Houston and I can say, you know, it's a hundred million dollars of taxpayer money being spent on lobbying the capital. Boy, that gets people's attention. Mm -hmm. well, and it's also the issues. And this is the thing that a lot of the transparency measures aren't measuring is 
what issues have your dollars been spent to advocate on, for, or against? Right. And not just what people register to testify on, but what did they actually go right. into somebody's right. office and try to talk them out of doing? And that's what people have the right to know. But I, I love local officials coming in and talking because I was one. I used to come sure. up here. With any, that door's open anytime. In fact, one of the funnier stories is Senator Perry had his, sep, his county judge and 17 mm -hmm. others and they had a meeting right at the start of the session because Perry wanted to show the, his county judges that I didn't have horns. And I said, I've only got horns for socialists, okay? Because that's, that's what I'm dealing with down in Southeast Texas in two counties. Yeah. It appears that appraisals are somewhat subjective. So I was wondering if anybody has considered uh, freezing property values at the value that that property is acquired for and then it is adjusted every time title changes or a sale takes place. Then we don't have to deal with appraisers that either appraise high on the north side or the south side or whatever. And also that person then purchasing the home that they've chosen to live in is somewhat protected from being taxed out of it. If somebody could tell me if that's been considered in any of your committees. There, there has been no idea like that has not been considered in these committees. We've had every conceivable mixture. You, you're really talking about a modified Proposition 13. Yes. Because, that's, because what that is, and, and even in California, they put a 1% tax rate limit on it and a 2% appreciation. Yes. So they didn't get to zero. But, but that was Howard Jarvis's legacy really to the whole country um, was that because that was just in their first big wave of property taxation. And again, if we had an INR, something like that would have already passed in the state of Texas. I, there's no doubt of it. Look, the urban areas now, the average homes are paying $5,000 in property taxes. And these are homes that are roughly 224, 25,000, okay? What's happened is rural and suburban are catching, have caught up, are catching up right now. Um, so, uh, so it just depends on how hot the pot is to boil. But that's because it took a really hot pot of, 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 of boiling water to get everybody ready to pass that bill. And because he's right, okay? I, when we started this, there was no guarantee the house was gonna pass property tax relief at all, okay? And I don't say that critically, but because we were trying to figure out whatever we could do to help them. Um, but the ice is broken, so give us a couple years on HB3, two and a half percent, SB2, two and a half percent, you'll like the relief that you'll see because especially the hard cap on schools really saves people money. Okay. Well, I think we have, a, do we have time for one more or no? Time. Okay. Right. She's selling me time. Uh, but I bet that these guys will stick around and answer any questions Absolutely. you have. Will you please join me in giving them a big round of applause? <laughs>